Hi guys, I'm Beth. This is the Read Remark Booktube channel and today I'm going to be talking to you about the best books of 2018. So these are both books that I read in 2018 and that were published in 2018. So it truly is a wrap up of the year. Without further ado, here are the five best books of 2018 as deemed by me. Number five is Sunburn by Laura Lipman and boy oh boy did I love this book. So it concerns a woman who has kind of a storied past. She shows up in this small town in a bar slash diner looking for work decides that she wants to stick there for a while and just take a break from life. People in the town don't really know what's going on with her. You know, what's going on with her past. They know that there's something there, but what it is, they don't know. It's very much a noir type of book, kind of with shades of things like Double Indemnity or Mildred Pierce. It's kind of a pot boiler of a book where everyone is gritty, everyone is dirty, everyone is possibly suspect. You don't know if they're up to no good, and the woman in particular, you don't know if she's a femme fatale or if she's a victim of her past who has grown to be stronger and bitter, but still inside has this pure heart of a person. Who knows? <laughs> the thing I loved about this book was just how kind of bittersweet it was in keeping with that whole noir tr tradition. You know, it wasn't it wasn't sickly sweet. It wasn't too over dramatically dramatic. Although one of the hallmarks of noir is that they do add some good pieces of drama into it. But it, the whole thing was kind of like angels with dirty wings. You know that show, that, that fake movie they had? At least I think it's fake on the Home Alone movies. That's kind of what I think of with noir books. These people all seem angelic on the outside, possibly, but we know that those wings are caked in mud. They are all dirty, every one of the characters. Number four is An American Marriage by Tayari Jones, and this was a really interesting one that made me think about the relationship, about what it says about society, um, about every part of it. So it concerns this married couple, Roy and Celestial. They are a young, married, newlywed couple. They're African-American when Roy is suddenly framed for a crime he didn't commit. He's put in jail for five years. What marriage can really survive that? You know, you see them writing letters back and forth to each other, Roy and Celestial, and you kind of see the relationship disintegrating a little bit, and then you see how his heart changes while he's inside the jail. You see how her heart changes while he's inside the jail, and then he gets out, and the whole relationship has turned by now. You know, when you take a glass globe and smash it against the ground, even if you glue the pieces back together, it's not going to be the same thing. Now what's interesting about this book is all the different shades and um, what ifs that it contained. You know, you have to wonder, what if he hadn't gone to jail? Would their marriage really have survived? Because we saw these glimpses of them in, early in their marriage. And we already started to see the cracks forming. He had this big priority to sit his wife down and make her to where she didn't have to work. Whereas we kind of saw on into the story that that's really where she excelled, was finding this work that was really, really meaningful to her. Um, he was kind of brash and loud. She was more quiet and a little bit, um, I, I thought of her kind of like as a, a hummingbird flitting around kind of nervously, not quite sure where she wants to land. Um, it was just a really interesting book because it made me think, you know, they should have had that chance to either make the marriage work or not work and it was torn away from them. And that's this whole other shade to the novel that's so interesting is the broken justice system and how easy it was for people to um, finger him and put him in jail and call him the perpetrator. Another thing that Tayari Jones does so well in this book is um, the characters of all the family members. I felt like I really knew Roy's parents. I felt like I really knew Celestial's parents. I knew her best friend. I knew all of these people, what made them tick, all the subtleties that make up their personalities. Um, 
And at the same time, Jones didn't really go into high detail on those people. It's not like she drew out these character analyses on each of the people. It's just she told the story so well that I got to know them through the telling of the story. So, excellent book, An American Marriage. All right, number three is The House of Impossible Beauties by Joseph Kassara. This book really surprised me. I checked it out without really having any expectations and then was really surprised by how much I came to care for all of these characters. It's based loosely on the people in a real life documentary called Paris is Burning. This is a group of, um, I think it's late 1970s or early 1980s drag queens living in Harlem. And it shows how a lot of them are very, very poor, you know, economically speaking, but very fabulous when they put together these costumes and outfits and identities and these families and houses where they find community with one another and go to the club in these fa fabulous get-ups and have contests. It's just, it's like they come alive and they completely rise above these circumstances in which hate crimes are still a very much real thing. Um, violence against people who are other than was still very much a real thing and so in these identities they were able to find themselves and really soar. So the House of Impossible Beauties takes these real people and writes a fictional account of them. It, it kind of shows them with their struggles, um, them finding each other as friends, them becoming families. You know, even though there's no bloodline there, they still find a very true, sometimes truer family than they were able to find with their actual families. It's really touching and it's really gritty. I mean, you see kind of the dirt underneath the glitter veneer. <laughs> And I love that. I love that it wasn't this attempt to, you know, completely whitewash the whole history and make everyone seem like a, a literal angel. And it wasn't an attempt to criminalize or, you know, make it seem more of a hard knock life than it was. It was just very multi-layered, very complex, very, very good what Kasara was able to do with these characters, you know. I talked about this on another video, but I was able to see all the layers of these characters. I saw the hope, I saw the despair, I saw the glitter and the dirt and the grit and the shininess and the fabulousness and the vulnerability and the sass and the wit and the victimhood and you know all of these pieces that made up all of these people I came to really care for all of them and it was just it was a beautiful book the house of impossible beauties number two is educated by Tara Westover this was another book that I went into without really having any expectations in fact I thought it was going to be an exposition on the state of education in America but I was very surprised to find out what it was instead. It has showed up on many best of 2018 book lists and that is no surprise to me whatsoever. It's a non-fictional account of Tara Westover's life off the grid. She lived with her large family in the mountains. There was no value put in education. In fact, formal education was kind of seen as the enemy. It was seen as almost satanic in nature. So Tara Westover grew up without really any sort of education. Eventually she began to teach herself using borrowed textbooks, which I cannot even imagine teaching yourself all of that stuff. But she was so successful at it that she was able to eventually get through college all the way through getting her PhD. Now, um, it, it's, it's not necessarily a triumph of a book, it's more a look at the obstacles that stood in her way. In particular, she had this brother who was really physically and emotionally abusive towards her that kept her in a state of both, you know, constant anxiety and fear and pain. Speaking of pain, the family didn't really believe in going to the doctor and so there are several spots in the book that, I mean, they really, really should have gone to a hospital and didn't, such as the father burning his hands so badly or burning his entire body really badly, or the mother getting brain damage from a bad car accident, or Tara herself getting really hurt in a car accident. It's just this big, um, 
denial of the world that exists outside of their own and suspicion of it and almost to the point that Tara became a black sheep by going to become part of this outside world, outside of her own insular family. It's really emotional and um, made me curious about what's happened since then. I've, I've looked up a few interviews that she's done and it looks like, you know, things are still not very much put back together with the family, which is unfortunate, or maybe fortunate, actually. Very interesting book. And what's also interesting is that it's so well written. I listened to another interview that she did where she talked about how to learn writing. She just listened to a book-based podcast for a while and was able to kind of suss out the different techniques that writers used. And so it just shows how well her brain is able to pick up on those things and how remarkable it is that she's able to do that. Although I wouldn't call the book braggadocious by any means, you know, it's not like Tara is sitting there in the book saying, look at all I have accomplished, go me, I am wonderful. That's not what it is at all. It's more just um, an unflinching look at, at a childhood that was less than ideal. And even going through college for her was very harrowing because she had so much to get over emotionally as well as educationally. I mean, she went into college not even knowing what the Holocaust was. So fascinating, fascinating book. book, the number one best book of 2018 as deemed by me is, drumroll please, Putney by Safka Zinoviev. This book was so interesting. <laughs> it follows a man named Ralph. He's 30 years old. He becomes smitten with a family friend's kid named Daphne. She's nine years old. The moment he sees her, Ralph's composer heart soars and he instantly becomes just enamored with Daphne. She is now his muse. As their relationship grows, it becomes more and more sexual until when she's 13 years old, they make love. But actually, to be more factual about it, he rapes her. He's in his 30s. She's 13 years old. That's rape. Now it looks at these different shades and of, of the relationship and at first I was a little bit nervous that this was maybe a retelling of Lolita or maybe it was a way that the author was trying to somehow justify this relationship between Ralph and Daphne. But everything that Safka Zinoviev was setting up in the earlier stages of the books really comes to fruition later in the book. Daphne goes through her childhood thinking this is a loving, um, albeit secret, clandestine relationship that she has with Ralph, it isn't until she's 50 years old that she realizes that this wasn't a relationship. There was nothing equal about this. It wasn't even love. It was more infatuation on his part that really was, you know, illegal. <laughs> it was illegal. And it takes, you know, seeing her own te young teenage daughter for the, for the dominoes to fall in place, or whatever the cliche saying is, for her to realize that's what was up. When she figures this out, what comes next is not necessarily so clean or cut and dry, or whatever cliche phrase you wanna apply to that. It's a lot more complicated and messy and dirty. And really, it's just so indicative of how things are in life. You know, people say things like, if this really happened, why didn't they report it all these decades ago when maybe they didn't realize that it was wrong at the time. Maybe they were afraid. Maybe they knew that they wouldn't be believed. And then it comes to fruition all these years later when they're not believed after they finally speak up, when they finally have the strength and fortitude to come forward, it's almost like they're shoved back into the shadows. And it's just really unfortunate. And I really, I can't say I enjoyed reading this fictional account of it, but I'll say it, it was insightful to me to kind of get to run through that story with a very personal story, not personal to me, but personal through Daphne's eyes of what happened and all the shades of the aftermath. So fascinating book, very well written by Safka Zinoviev number one book of the year, in my opinion. What were your favorites of 2018? Let me know. I want to hear them. 
I love looking through all the lists and seeing people's favorite and least favorite. It's a great year for reading. I can't wait to hear your favorites and thank you as always for watching and thank you to all the authors for writing these wonderful books. I really enjoy it. Thanks, I'll catch you next time. Bye. That's not a homeless person asleep on the bench behind me, by the way. That's my oldest kid. <laughs>